I mean, if you some people will say, well, farmland, yeah, sure. But, you know, if you have farmland, especially if it's productive and there's chaos in the world, somebody's going to say, look over there, Daryl's got some productive farmland. Let's go get it. And they come and get your, your farm, productive farmland. You better have your gold hidden when they come around looking for whatever assets you have. Think. Act. <laughs> and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey, Jim, how you doing today? Good to have you back on. Well, I think I'm fine. As far as I know, I'm fine. Uh, and I'm very keen to see you again. It's been a little while. This has been a few weeks, a few months, actually, since we last saw you last. Here I am. You look fine. I think I was in New New Orleans the last time we spoke. I was at the uh, investment conference down there. And, um, yeah, I think we did the interview. I was in the uh, hotel room. So, yeah, it's definitely a good, good session. We talked about your upbringing and just how you got into the world of finance and investing. And, and you have a very... Uh, very inspiring story, especially for people that that have not um, that have not really traveled down the the realm of finance and money and growing up in small towns and trying to figure this out, right? You know, and so uh, it's this very inspirational story. Uh, so I, I do want to get into a, a few things today. Um, we've we've talked multiple times about uh, the the markets and. Um, you know, obviously, many people are. Some people are waiting on the big, the big crash. Uh, we talked about markets rallying, leading into elections, and one thing I'm I'm coming to to know is the um, the uh, the concept of patience. You know, and and so I I really want to dive into like how you view patience and how you've you've seen like we've talked about you seeing this movie multiple times over and over again. Um, and I, I really want to dive into how you, um, how did you work on your patience with these markets and, and waiting on these things to play out? Well, I, I don't know if I work on my patience or I'm just lazy. Either way, you know, uh, one thing I have learned is that I have to wait until it's the right time or the right place, or the right whatever, the right company, because just jumping in, because I get emotional or excited, rarely works, never works. The only thing that works is to wait for the right time and the right place and the right company. Uh, it You call it patience. I guess it is patience. Uh, maybe it's just experience. After a long time, I know that if I act on emotion or if I act too soon, it usually is a mistake. So I hope I have learned to wait, to wait until things are right. And I still make mistakes. I still make mistakes. Yeah, that's that's very interesting because it's such a simple uh, principle, but many people struggle with it. I mean, especially you know, when people want to just jump in and, oh, I got to make money really fast instead of like really playing the long game, really um, allowing things to work heavily in your favor. Um, and Rick Rule talks about time being on your side. And so we, he's mentioned that multiple times on the channel. And I know that uh, since my me being in, in the market, um, uh, only about four years. I, I'm, I'm a baby, man. I'm a baby. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and I, I've noticed that when I'm impatient, I miss out on a lot of opportunities. And in one, one thing that I've been sharing with my audience that I've learned is that also the balance between being too bearish and too bullish as well. And so th those are some of the things that, that I've, that I've learned. Uh, how, how do you manage, obviously, you know, managing your emotions, but how do you manage uh, being too bearish versus too bullish? And because sometimes you can miss out on opportunities when you're in one camp or the other. 
time out, quick break in the action. This message is brought to you by the Rural Symposium. This annual symposium is hosted by the legendary investor Rick Rule himself. It will take place from July 7th through 11th in Boca Raton, Florida. Mr. Rule invites some of the most brilliant minds in macroeconomics and natural resource investing. This year, featured speakers include Danielle DiMartino Booth, Nomi Prins, Jim Rickards, Grant Williams, Lobo Tigre, and more. Rick even organizes the Living Legends panel where he invites individuals who have built billion dollar businesses from scratch. Attendees will be introduced to a myriad of companies active in the natural resources space, with the companies invited being the ones that Rick Rule invests in himself. The symposium is held at the Boca Raton, which is an amazing resort with exceptional amenities. I attended in 2023 and thoroughly enjoyed my time there. I went on an amazing cruise with Rick and other investors and CEOs of companies and even had the opportunity to test drive an Ashton Martin for the first time. So don't miss out on this opportunity to have fun and receive high quality education to help secure your financial future. Click the link below to sign up and I promise you won't regret it. But if you do, Rick offers an amazing money back guarantee. So what are you waiting for? Click the link below to sign up today. Now, without further ado, let's get back to the content. Well, if the worst thing that happens to you is you miss opportunities, you're going to have a good life. I assure you. Uh, because all the rest of us, while you're waiting for opportunities, are making mistakes and losing money. So learn to be patient and don't worry about missing opportunity. I assure you, Daryl. There are lots and lots of opportunities out there. And if you miss 10 in a row, they're going to be another 10 if you just wait. So I don't know if I've learned that by experience or foolishness or whatever, but I hope that I have learned just wait. If I miss something, don't worry. There are going to be other opportunities. So please do not worry when you miss something. Mm hmm. Yes. And like just diving into that a little more, you know, in terms of missing something. Right. So we like we talked about uh, uranium uh, before and we had a big price move in uranium from what, twenty five dollars a pound to one hundred dollars a pound. And it, then it dropped back down to eighty eight. And so uh, when someone is trying to you know, navigate and figure out, okay, did I miss the boat or am I still early, right? Like this, does this, does this asset have a lot more further to go? Uh, what, what are some ways that you, that you measure that? Well, all I can say to you is that when I miss something, I try to do more research to see if it's over. You're right. Maybe it's over. And if it's over, don't worry. When I was young in the business, the guys used to always, I don't know if they say it anymore, I used to always say, lots of girls at the beach. Don't worry. There are plenty of girls at the beach. Um, and it's the same with stocks, investments. Even if you miss many, there are many, many more, I assure you. It's astonishing how the world is always changing. Countries are always changing. Industries are always changing. And if you miss many of them, just wait. There'll be something else. Do not think, oh, gosh, I missed it. I got to jump in. I got to jump in and act because I've missed it. You haven't missed it. There's some more. Just, just wait. Try to learn to be patient. I hope I've learned that after years of mistakes. <laughs> yes, yes. And one of the mistakes that, that I've made is is uh, buying an asset really cheap and not being patient enough to to let it to let it uh, increase in price, and obviously that that can be a a gift and a curse, right? It it can go down further and it may not ever increase back uh, to you know uh, its trend lines or whatever. But I've I've missed that a few times in in the this recent bull run uh, over the last year where I sold some assets 
when they were very cheap and now those assets are, are very um, expensive. And so <laughs> I was, I was kind of like, ah, why didn't I just hold on to it? And so uh, do you have those experiences too? Well, of course, of course. But I hope I have learned that, okay, I missed it. Forget it. Put it out of your mind. Don't think about it and move on to the next thing, whatever the next thing is. Or if there's no next thing yet, just wait. There will be another next thing. I promise you, Daryl, the world is not running out of investment ideas. Maybe you and I are running out of investment ideas, but there are plenty more coming down the down the street. Don't worry. Yes, yes, that's that's great, great advice. So uh, I've recently heard you talk about the Chinese um, markets and that seems like a really some, some of the emerging market stocks that, that I've been seeing seem fairly um, undervalued or uh, cheap. And I've been investing and accumulating some Chinese uh, ETFs for the most part just to uh, because they, they were significantly cheap compared to where they used to be. Um, and right now we're seeing like all time highs in the S and P, all time highs in the Dow Jones, and and that seems like the area where it's cheap. But obviously, you know, there's concerns around the Chinese economy and everything. Uh, do you have an updated assessment on China? Well, I know that China is one of the few markets in the world these days which is still down. You know, they China got hit with a virus uh, in a big way. And they got hit with a huge bubble, a pop property bubble, which popped. It was one of the biggest bubbles the world's ever seen. Now, it, and they tried to stop it for a while, but unsuccessfully. But now something has stopped it. It has popped. That usually leads to opportunities. You know, when a country goes through a huge bubble and a huge pop, everybody is despondent and in despair. But there are opportunities. Now, what they are, I don't know. That's what I'm trying to find out, just like you are, apparently. But I know that there are opportunities in China, just as I know there are in other places in the world. Yes, it's frustrating, infuriating sometimes not to find them. Or worse, it's infuriating to find them, and then they don't go up. You sit there and you hold them. And they don't, the rest of the world doesn't see what you see. Don't worry, that's going to happen to you many times. I hope it happens many times to you. But in the end, if you've done your research and you're right, somebody's going to figure it out eventually. And the risk, of course, is that you sell, you give up too soon. Don't worry, that's happened to all of us. And it will happen to all of us again. Could, could you give us a um, an example of an investment that that you uh, that you had a strong conviction on and you waited it out and it and it and it paid off in the end? Um, what's one of those experiences been like for you? Well, as we're talking about China, I mean, I started investing in China long ago, um, and in fact, originally when I went. The, to New York, back to New York, and I said, China, China, China. It was the days when everybody was saying, Japan, Japan, Japan. So they thought I was foolish. For a while, I looked foolish because Japan was very hot. China barely had a market. But eventually, it paid off in a big, big way. Now, of course, I mean, that was a long time ago. Now, of course, China's suffering. It had the virus. It had a gigantic real estate bubble. Now China's bubble popped, and now the market's down. Does that mean you should buy? Who knows? Who knows? But I have been around long enough to know that when the market is depressed, I should be looking anyway. Mm hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. That 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 makes sense. And. Whenever and by the way, let me just say also that right now, Carol, as I look around the world, there are not many markets that are depressed. Nearly everything 
nearly all, even Japan, which was depressed for 35 years, even Japan now is making new all-time highs. So there's very few places that I know where they are depressed these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And so how do you manage your your risk or your what's your risk tolerance like? So say like you get into a market and you, you believe that it's cheap and then the prices fall more um, at, at one point. I mean, prices can keep falling, right? And how, how do you manage that risk? Do you buy, do you buy more? Or do you like set aside a certain amount of capital to buy more at a lower price and such, so on and so forth? Like, how, how do you play that out? Well, some people, uh, people I know use stop losses, you know, if uh, something goes down 15% or whatever number they use, they automatically sell. There are times I wish I had done that. Um, but no, I don't use stop losses. As I say, there are times I wish I had used stop losses. But uh, when things go against me, all I know to do is to, to do more research and try to figure out if I was wrong, if I've made a mistake, and if not, what do I do? And usually I figure out, no, I've been right. I've done the research. My, my conclusion is right. It's just the timing is bad. I wish I were a good market timer, Darrell. Oh, my gosh. I think I must be the worst market timer in the world. Uh, having been around and tried market timing for a long time. Now, if you're good at market timing, you have a skill, an asset. But I don't have it usually. And I don't know how to get it except mistakes, more mistakes. Yes, yes, I understand that, you know, and that's that's one of the the principles that, that I follow is not trying to time tops or bottoms. Uh, however, um, you know, you have to be able to manage risk and and also be able to take profits whenever uh, they come your way. Um, so leading into like uh, commodities. Gold's at an all time high priced in dollars as it's measured in dollars. Uh, it hasn't reached an all-time high adjusted for inflation. Uh, what, what are you seeing there with, with gold? And what, why do you think we're, we're at this level where we're at now? Well, I own gold, as you know. I've owned gold for a long time. My view on gold, and this is maybe a mistake, but my view on gold is it's something I always want to own. It's something I want my children to have someday because throughout history, when there are gigantic problems, all of us peasants know that gold and silver are good to have in the closet or under the bed. And so that's my view of gold. I don't see my gold as I look at, as I see stocks or other investments. I look gold as an emergency treasure if I ever need it. Uh, likewise, silver, silver and gold, because throughout history, when the world is in chaos, everybody will accept gold and silver, and there is very little else that the world will always accept when there's chaos. And if you know something, you know, to tell me about it, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you, some people will say, well, farmland. Yeah, sure. But. You know, if you have farmland, especially if it's productive and there's chaos in the world, somebody's going to say, look over there, Daryl's got some productive farmland. Let's go get it. And they come and get your, your farm, productive farmland. You better have your gold hidden when they come around looking for whatever assets you have. Yeah, yeah, agreed. And so with, with the, um, obviously, the recent price moves, gold is staying strong in the midst of uh, interest rates still elevated. Uh, we have a lot of central banks buying it uh, still. And so it seems that, um, you know, for me, like I have more of a conviction on gold rather than silver, even though silver is like 50% off 
off of its highs, right? Silver still hasn't moved in relation to like how gold has been. But, you know, when I'm looking at um, central banks buying gold, um, also the resilience of gold in the midst of high interest rates and inflation, uh, I, I just have more conviction on that. Do you, do you have a take on that? Well, I own both. Uh, you're right. Silver is down 50% from its all-time high and gold is making all-time highs. So on a historic basis, it appears that silver is cheaper. So if I were buying one today, I would buy more silver and not more gold. I'm not doing either right now. But if I were doing something, I would buy silver. Does that mean when the world comes to an end, my silver is going to save me? Of course it doesn't. But at the moment... My reading of history and of the world in the past is both of them will probably save you if you need it. And at the moment, silver is cheaper than gold. But, it, it you know, at times in, in the world, well, for instance, silver at times has been much, much more desirable. The American monetary system, and when the, the country started, was based on silver. You know, the Middle East. Everything was, Jesus Christ was sold for 30 pieces of silver, not gold. Because in many times in history, the world has used silver more than gold. Both have had their uses in history, depending on where in the world. But sometimes it's been silver, sometimes it's been gold. I own both. But Darrell, if you're going to ask me which one, I don't know. But I would buy silver today if I were buying either. Mm -hmm. Yes. And, you know, I share this with my audience. Like I do have some silver bucks that watch. I'm still buying like silver. Um, I mean, I just bought a few ounces just the other day. It's like something that's still part of me where it's like, Hey, let, let me still buy some of this, even though, you know, silver is more of an industrial metal now. I, I think that it's going to come in handy. I still buy junk silver and such, and I, I just think that is is good just to have. Um, and so, yeah, I'm still I'm still in in the trade. I haven't necessarily been in the silver equities. I've been in the gold equities. Uh, have you been uh, accumulating any of the gold or silver stocks? Those seem to be uh, more beaten down than the actual metals themselves. No, I'm too lazy. I, I have the gold and I have the silver. You know, I have both. And I mainly these days buy coins because gold and silver coins are, in most of the world, recognized and people understand what they are and people understand they have value. That's not always the case with a block of silver or a block of gold. People will be suspicious, is it real, blah, blah, blah. But nearly everybody will recognize a U.S. silver dollar as something that is valuable and something that they should accept. But I have learned that what you need is something that is internationally recognized as something that's value and something that's easy to transport. Now, does that mean I always get it right or that I will get it right in the future? Of course not. But easily transportable and widely recognized, I have learned, are two very important values. Mm -hmm. So would it be fair to say that uh, gold and silver are more of your insurance? Uh, you mentioned earlier a treasury. You know, if if things, you know, really go south, that's the purpose for that and you're not really engaged in the mining sector or exploration companies and and things of that nature is that correct but darrell if you know a company that's going to find a, a big deposit of silver in berlin don't listen to me <laughs> buy it and then send me an email there are fabulous investments and always have been in world history and buying companies or mines or producers. On the other hand, do you remember Mark Twain, who was a great American writer once upon a time? <laughs> Mr. Twain once said quite publicly and 
insightfully, he said the definition of a gold mine is a hole in the ground with a liar standing at the top. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Twain got involved with a scam, obviously, at one time, a gold mining scam. There have certainly been many scams in world history and silver and gold and many other things. Well, Mr. Twain got involved with one of those. So I'm sure you're smarter than Mark Twain, but still be careful. Always be. I have learned to always be careful. And for me, one of the advantages of silver is that I don't have to do a lot of research on whether that guy really has silver in the ground and knows how to mine it and can mine it cheaply. Owning the silver itself is simpler for me these days. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that makes, that makes life a lot more simple, <laughs> simpler. Um, so other commodities, uh, right now we, we've seen a huge price rise in, in uranium. Uh, we see oil is still pretty steady. Um, around 80, 80 something dollars a barrel. And, um, so are you looking at any of those or are you just actively holding any of those types of commodities or what, what's your take on that? Well, I try to be aware of what's going on in the world. Obviously, it's a gigantic world and thousands of investments, possibilities. I try to be aware of things. I, I am aware of what you just said. Does that mean I'm buying uranium or anything? Not at the moment. But I hope that if an opportunity arises, I will take advantage of it. Uh, I'm, since I am a little lazy now, I try to buy ETFs or baskets. It's easy to buy a basket of shares or commodities or other things. And that is simpler uh, for me these days. But yeah, if you can figure out which agricultural commodity is going to go up the most don't listen to me do your research and buy it because that's how you can make a huge fortune if you can get the specifics and focus and zero in mm -hmm. yeah yeah and so is that part of so what i've some things that i've learned is that um you know, the older you get, the the less risk you take. And, and so obviously with the ETFs, you know, you're not having to um, you're, you're not having to do like a lot of in-depth research. You're pretty much trusting the company to do the research and, and pick the, the best companies within the ETF. And um, so is that more of like, hey, I'm at the age where I, I've made my money. I don't want to take as much risk and I don't have the time to to research and 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 get into the the nuances of feasibility studies and, you know, for uh, exploration st companies and things of that nature. Is that is that uh, kind of where you at right now? Well, uh, I hope not. I hope I still do enough research or awareness to know that that's a good ETF. If somebody says, I have an ETF on Brazilian shares, I don't just rely on that person, whoever it is, or no matter how smart she is. I try to do at least enough cursory, if nothing else, research to make sure she has got the right, or got a lot of good Brazilian ETF, uh, Brazilian shares in her ETF. I have learned Many of us make mistakes, and just because somebody has an ETF doesn't mean he knows what he's doing. You know, when I first went to Wall Street, there were all these people who were more experienced and educated, and I assumed they knew what they were doing. I knew I did not know what I was doing, but it didn't take me long, Daryl, to find out they didn't know what they were doing either. So I came to realize that just because somebody is on Wall Street and is a vice president or something does not mean he knows what he's doing. So please at least do enough backup research to be sure you're doing the right thing. Because relying on others is usually a mistake. 
for me, it's usually a mistake. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes total sense. And how do you balance? Do you focus a lot more on uh, or do you focus more on dividend paying companies? Are you more into like the compounding over time aspect of um, of dividend payments? Well, I mean, we all know that dividends are money in hand, you know, money you can spend or invest or do what you want to with. So obviously that's a part of any equation if you look at something. But you, I don't have a simple answer. You're saying, okay, Jim, which chapter do I read to get the answers? Daryl, I haven't found the right chapter yet. I haven't found, found page 37, which will give me all the answers. No, it's an ongoing, ever-changing process. That's why it's exciting and fun and challenging, because it's always changing. I don't have a simple answer. I wish I did. But if you find the chapter that I should read, please tell me, because I want to read the chapter that has all the answers. I haven't found it yet. Yes, yes, to totally understand that. So right now we're in the U.S., we're in a election year. Markets are hitting all-time highs. Uh, many people have abandoned the recession narrative. Um, uh, where are you foreseeing there? Are, are you still, are you expecting a some type of recession at some point? I mean, obviously it's going to come at some point, but... Um, it seems like people have abandoned that narrative. They've been calling for it all of last year, we, which we did have a big downturn in October of 22. We, we also had a big downturn uh, the fall of last year as well. But, um, yeah, where, where are you at with, with that aspect? Well, Darrell, I know, like I can read in the paper, that it's been 15 years since we had a major recession in the U.S. or stock market problem. Uh, I know that that's the longest in American history. I mean, maybe it's going to go on 30 years. I don't know. I do know that it's the longest so far in American history. And that is a reason for me to question or to worry, if nothing else, because, I mean, America's been around a couple hundred years. We've never had such a long period without a problem. That, if nothing else, makes me ask questions and worry. I Have I started selling short or something? No, I don't have any shorts. But I am watching and worrying about what's going on. I see exuberance starting to develop. I see many new investors coming in and say, oh, it's so easy to make money in the stock market. And it's fun. I've seen this movie before, and when you have a lot of people talking about it, and especially new people, talking about how easy it is and how much fun it is, it usually means you should start asking questions. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And it, it's kind of interesting with the... Uh, the discrepancies and like the um, economic data that's coming out. Uh, we, you know, the Fed is projected to cut rates. And then um, at one point we were getting, uh, obviously inflation seemed to be going down. Then it started upticking up again. And there's been discrepancies with the job numbers. Uh, you have leading economic indicators and <laughs> it's, it's, it's so much stuff. Um, you know, in which for me, I kind of just took a back seat a little bit, you know, in terms of, um, you know, not uh, getting too, too caught up into the psychological piece of it, where it's like, I'm waiting on recession, I'm waiting on recession, I'm waiting on recession. Uh, I just started positioning my portfolio in a way where, uh, where I have some protection. And, um, and I think that that's been helpful for my peace of mind. Uh the, have you been constructing yourself in a way? I think you said you're holding U.S. dollars or something um, that's been giving you peace of mind during this time. Well, I don't own U.S. dollars to give me peace of mind. I hope I own U.S. dollars because I think it's a good investment, and I do. Uh, I mean, the U.S. is the largest debtor nation in the history of the world, so you would 
someone would say, well, why do you own U.S. dollars? I own them because historically, when there are problems, for historic reasons, people turn to the U.S. dollar. And I expect that next time there's a problem, many people in the world are going to buy U.S. dollars. But that's what they think. That's what they know. So that's why I own U.S. dollars. Now, that means, of course, that if we do have a big problem, the U.S. dollar is going to go up some more. And at some point, it's going to get overpriced. I hope I'm smart enough to sell the U.S. dollars if and when that happens. Now, what you should ask me now is, well, what are you going to do with your, dollar, your money then? Ah, uh, I don't know. I don't know what the new competitor for the U.S. dollar is. Maybe it's silver. I don't know. Maybe it's wheat. I don't know. But that's I am doing. That's what I'm doing at the moment, because I know the history of the investment world for the last few decades. Anyway, has been that when people get worried, they turn to U.S. dollars. If they do it again, I'm well positioned. But then I'll have the problem of, okay, you did it right. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> and I don't have the answer yet. I have to turn to Daryl to find out what to do. Yes. Um, and so when when the Fed cuts rates and say they um, stop the quantitative uh, tightening, I think they're supposed to be tapering that or something. Um, and eventually... I think that they're going to finance the government debt, right? I mean, with this this budget deficit, I don't just don't I just don't see it going anywhere. I haven't even looked at the um, at the national debt uh, in in a few probably about two months. I wonder where it's at. <laughs> so, um, you know, is would that be like a confirmation of like, okay, I need to get out of the dollar. Um, the Fed's going to be printing more money. This money needs to go somewhere and some assets. And so it may be a good time to, to start um, getting rid of dollars. Well, what I'm expecting is that at some point along the way, the U.S. dollar is going to have a big rally, perhaps the last big rally. And if and when that happens and everybody is turning to U.S. dollars, I hope that if it happens that way, that I'm smart enough to sell. But to repeat, the problem is, OK, then what do I do? I don't see another currency in the world right now that is something that I would put my all, all or a lot of my money into. In theory, the Chinese currency should be it. But the Chinese currency is not convertible, not fully convertible now. So, I mean, I don't know, Daryl. I'm looking. And I don't have an answer yet. So I say, I hope I find the answer, but I haven't found it yet. Yes, yes. So, yeah, I, I was just looking at the um, the national debt. It's at about 30, $34.6 Um yeah, the budget deficits uh, about one point eight trillion. Uh, so yeah, it's, it seems. <laughs> but Darryl, but Darryl. That's, that's the reported. That's the, what's on the books. But there are many off balance sheet, gigantic obligations that the U.S. government has. Social, you many social security to start. You know, those obligations are real obligations. And there are other obligations like that that are not normally counted. I mean, if you count them all up, it's over a couple of hundred trillion dollars. These are not small numbers. So far, because of historic reasons, people accept the U.S. dollar. And I own a lot of U.S. dollars, but I know the reality is that if and when people start asking questions or getting answers, I'm not the only one who's going to be worried about the U.S. dollar. And I don't have an answer yet. I want to repeat. I have the questions, but I don't have the answers yet. Yes, I'm, I'm going to be watching your interviews, your other interviews, see if I can uh, find the answers when they come. Uh, yeah. I'm well, I <laughs> hope it's that easy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the uh, U.S. unfunded liabilities, 214 trillion. 
uh, trillion dollars. And yeah, obviously the, the Social Security and Medicare is, is a big, a big one. So that, that's that's been one of the things that I've been really uh, just trying to prepare myself for and prepare my family for, because it, it just seems like, you know, obviously I. I don't think that anyone should be relying on the government to to, um, you know, provide for their needs. But, you know, obviously that's some people are in those positions. But when I'm looking at Social Security, me being 36 years old, they haven't changed the legislation since the early 80s. Uh, you have all the baby boomers uh, coming of retirement age by 2030. And uh, there's already studies that are out saying that by 2033 or 2032, where they're going to have to cut Social Security significantly unless something changes. You know, it's it's just like, man, Jim, I, I can't I can't be putting my future in the government's hands like that. Well, Daryl, it's a good time to be an old American. It's not a good time to be a young American. You have the problem that you're a young American. I have young kids. No. I mean, I love America. I love blah, blah, blah. But I have to be a realistic. You just said it. You've done some research. You see the problem. Well, I see the problem, too. That is gigantic. But somebody who's 26 or 36 or 46 even, there are going to be huge problems in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that that leads me to think about historic tax rates. I think the the mean the median for historic tax rates would be around somewhere around upwards of fifty percent. Um, I think the highest it's ever been was like ninety something percent. And right now, with with these this amount of unfunded liabilities, it seems like uh, taxation is is definitely going to. Uh, come. I mean, we already have the inflation tax, but it seems like the, the government tax may, may have to increase in the future as well. Well, I mean, you can add, obviously. <laughs> That's a great, a great asset. They can't add in Washington. You know, they can't, sub they can't even subtract in Washington. And therein lies our problem and the country's problem in the future. I'm glad you can add. I wish they could add in Washington. Then we would at least maybe something would someone would address the problem instead of ignoring the problem and say, "Don't worry." Ah. If you listen to the politicians when they say, "Don't worry," you will really worry. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, for sure. Well, uh, I think we can leave on that that sobering note. I think that um, ultimately, um, for those who are watching, my strategy is <laughs> uh, obviously physical silver and gold, uh, having uh, tax tax sheltered investments such as Roth IRAs, and I've been getting into the uh, uh, the universal life policies as well, and so uh, just the things that have laws that that I could be grandfathered in you know, if they were to change them in the future, but who, who knows what the government's going to do, but you know, it's, you, you just have to play your cards the best way you can, you know? Well, you mentioned some good, some good assets, some good investments, but I would also suggest that people look around the world because there are other countries and maybe they're good investments in other countries. Uh, maybe, I don't know, but having all of your eggs in one country, yes, I'm an American too. We're all Americans. But having all of your assets or investments in one country might be dangerous in the future. It might be good to have some protection somewhere else. There are some successful countries in the world. There have been in history. So maybe some diversification into other places might be another leg to the investments you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's really helpful. Well, Ari, Jim, I appreciate you for coming on and everything, man, always appreciative of your time. And um, yeah, thank you. Look forward to having you back sometime.
Well, Daryl, it's always fun, always educational for me. So I'm, I'm keen, and thank you for having me. All right, all right. Take care. Now be now worried. Now be worried. And be, and be careful. careful. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.